as enthusiastic about the game of hockey as I am, you're probably aware that learning the skills takes a lot of time and effort. My job is to teach those skills to high school students. This video is going to take you through my training program, which has been developed for all age levels. It's been widely used in coaching clinics and in youth programs. And it's a result of years of my own personal experience, basically of what works best. Sending it around. You're going to learn the importance of stick handling and how to improve your performance. Stick handling is at least as important as skating, in my opinion. There are many good skaters who lack stick handling skills, but talented stick handlers are always in demand. There's no magic to being a great stick handler. It just takes a lot of time, effort, and practice. Let's start with the stick. The length of the stick is a key factor in developing stick handling skills. When the player is on his skates, the top should be at about the bottom of his chin, or maybe even a touch lower. If it's too long, he's really going to be inhibited with stick handling. Many young players don't want to have their sticks cut off. But as a coach and a teacher, you have to insist that they cut them. The knob of the stick is really important. If it's too large, the smaller hands that have to go around it are not going to be as effective in controlling the stick. Keep it small with a wad of tape. That's all that's really necessary. Look at the difference in width between these two sticks. The wider one on the right is for the bigger boys, while the smaller one on the left is going to be much more effective for the smaller hands of the younger player. The blades of these two sticks are not that much different but it's important for these youngsters to be able to fit the handle to their hands. The grip that should be used is at an angle on the shaft. Both hands should show a V position between the thumb and forefinger. The top hand controls the stick handling. It produces the power and strength. The bottom hand should be loose. The distance the hands are apart will vary. If they're too close together, you'll lose the strength. If the bottom hand is too far down the shaft, your range will be restricted, and your skating will be adversely affected. Stick handling skills cannot be developed to a high level of proficiency by just spending an hour or two on the ice. That's why we've come up with the dry land exercise program, which has been proven effective. In dry land exercises, the puck is replaced by a customized wiffle ball. The ball we use is really effective. It's not too light, and it resembles a puck. Now we can slide it across a hard surface effectively. We start with a tennis ball, cutting it in half. We then divide it more into fourths, and then into eighths, and then into sixteenths. Then we take a round wiffle ball and twist those pieces of tennis ball into it. All 16 pieces will go into the wiffle ball. Now you have a practice ball that has the proper light weight, but without the bounce of a tennis ball. It's better than any we've been able to find on the market, and the price is right. Expansion of reach is one of the key factors in stick handling that can be effectively practiced off the ice. Our goal is to expand the player's reach out of his present comfort zone. Every player has this comfort zone, the area where he feels confident in controlling the puck. Our goal is to expand this comfort zone into new levels of confidence. This is best achieved by continuous practice. Losing the puck is something they can't be afraid to do. This exercise gets them to expand their comfort zone. Here, Matt is expanding his reach on both sides. After this practice, he'll be easily able to expand 12 to 15 feet on the ice. Now he's expanding to the backhand side only. Notice that he releases the bottom hand and then brings it back. Players have to become comfortable with doing that on the backhand side. When doing the forehand side, notice that both hands remain on the stick. Notice that the arms are free and away from the body. Now we're going to practice another move called cupping 
or appearing to give the puck to the opponent only to quickly take it back again. Matt appears to be giving the puck away and then cups the stick over the top, as you see here, and then quickly pulls it back. Constant repetition of this exercise gets the players to push the puck out further than they're presently used to and still get it back quickly without the fear of losing it. We're going to add a variation to the cupping maneuver. After taking the puck away, we now reach around to our backhand side and then go around. Watch again how he does this. He puts it out, takes it back quickly, and just as the other player reaches for the puck, he goes around on the backhand side. The figure eight exercise is designed to develop a feel for the puck, which we commonly refer to as soft hands. This means a sensitivity for exactly how to handle the puck and the stick together with speed and accuracy. The figure eight exercise is accomplished by placing two pucks approximately eight feet apart. The exercise is practiced both clockwise and counterclockwise. It's designed to extend the reach comfort zone and lets the player learn to transfer his weight from one side of his body to the other. Students are encouraged to look up when practicing these exercises and not down at the puck. To develop a feel for where the puck is on the blade without actually having to look at it all the time. Here's an excellent exercise that really works to improve our extended reach. We call it the wide movement drill. Pucks are set up on the floor and are used as markers for the drill. If you're going to do this exercise on the garage floor, put a little magic marker spot where each puck should go so you won't have to measure it each time. The seven pucks should measure eight to 10 feet apart, four on one side and three on the other, staggered about four to six feet on each side. Here Matt is going to go down the middle moving the puck from side to side, extending to both the forehand and the backhand. His speed will improve as he gets more comfortable in handling the puck further away from his body. Our players enjoy competing with each other doing this exercise. In the quick stick drill, 10 pucks are set up in a straight line and the player is to weave the ball from side to side in a very rapid manner. This is a great way for the players to become more comfortable with the puck, even when performing this exercise with a ball on dry land. This is the purpose of all our dry land exercises. Dry land exercises give them the confidence they'll need later on the ice. Here's the expansion of reach exercise, which you'll recall was the first dry land exercise. Because their dry land experiences have made them more proficient, the player should find it easier to transfer these skills to the ice arena. This exchange expands the reach of the player as he moves the puck from side to side. This is a great confidence builder. Here these students are expanding their reach to the forehand side, bringing the puck to the middle, extending it to the forehand side, back to the middle, and again to the forehand. I constantly tell our players that they're not challenging themselves enough if they're not losing the puck from time to time. Right. Here's the expanded reach to the backhand side. Notice that the bottom hand releases as we expand this reach. As in the forehand, we reach out, bring it back to the middle, handle it, and then reach it out again. The key factor in cupping the puck is to develop the ability to present the puck to the opponent in an inviting manner, and then quickly take it away. On the ice, players will improve their skills of cupping the puck that they worked on previously on dry land with the wiffle ball. They're now able to be comfortable with moving the puck out further. This is a tough skill to learn. As the players develop this skill, they're able to push the puck further out and quickly cup it back. 
Now we move into what we call the give, take away, and go around. The player offers the puck, pulls it back, and then goes around to the backhand side using his body to protect the puck. Now we're making it a little harder. We're asking the players to do a 360 degree turn to the forehand side. The players should do this as quickly as possible and they should not be afraid of losing the puck. You'll notice that in a tight controlled turn, while both hands remain on the stick, the top hand goes way underneath. This is a good example of why our hockey sticks can't be too long. If a player's stick is too long, he's not able to do this maneuver effectively. Notice that the puck remains close to the body on both the forehand and the backhand turn. Try not to allow the puck to get too far away from the body. Here we see a 360 turn on the backhand side. The first time, Joe gets the puck out a little bit too far away from him. But the third time is an excellent example of the 360 backhand turn. See how close the puck is held to the player's body? This still shows it even better. Here are some more examples of what can happen if you let the puck get too far away. As you can see, this is a tough maneuver to control on the backhand side of the stick. Here we see Andy sliding the puck through his feet. Players often have the puck in their skates as they play games. They need to know how to effectively get that puck back up to their sticks. Here's another example of this, now on the backhand side. By practicing this maneuver, Joe is going to be a lot more comfortable when he gets the puck in his skates during a crucial time. Now let's take a look at faking the slap shot. When faking the slap shot, a player comes down, deeks like he's going to take the slap shot, and then pushes the puck, this time to his forehand side. Here's another example of this. The backhand side is a lot more difficult because literally what we try to do is slap the puck and then try to recover it on our backhand. And that's a tough move. The players must learn to actually do a fake and not just go through the motion. Here's another skill move. Joe's towing the puck, skating over the top of it, turning to his forehand side and quickly recovering it. Watch him do that again. He toes the puck, makes a controlled turn on the forehand side. But as you can see, he's going too far away from the puck. Here is what is called a Bobby Orr escape move. Not a 360, but stop, pivot, and go on to your backhand side. On the Bobby Orr move, the bottom hand slides way down on the turn to the backhand side the top hand extends out away from the body. Look at how his left hand slides down the shaft. This is a very important part of the Bobby Orr escape move because it helps bring the puck in close to our body where we can protect it. Slide the bottom hand down the shaft. Extend the top hand out away from the body. This enables the puck to stay close to us so we can protect it and control it. Here's another good move to improve puck handling skills. Joe toes the puck to the onside skate using the outside edge of that skate to guide the puck. He then kicks it back to his stick. This diagram will give you a better idea of what I'm talking about. The difference between the backhand and the forehand versions of this move are shown here. These simple drills teach players how to handle the puck, and as they continue to practice them, they'll see and feel the improvement, and they'll take a lot of pride in that.
Cones are very useful practice tools. A single deke is a faking maneuver where we deceive the opponent on which way we're going. Watch Matt come up to the cone. Notice the great distances the puck is traveling on this exercise. This slow motion sequence shows just how great a distance that puck is actually traveling. He's going to shift his weight from one side to the other. Then he's going to extend the puck to the right side and then bring it back around. Here comes Andy. He's going to fake to the forehand, bring it to the backhand, come around, cut back in behind the opposition, a key part of the maneuver. Now it's Joe's turn. This younger player may not have the skill of the older ones, but watch how he fakes to the backhand, moves around to his forehand side, recovers, sets, and fakes. He pulls the puck back around, shifts the weight. This is a good example of transferring the weight. Here's Matt again. He makes a fake to the backhand side, cuts to the forehand, cuts around, ripping the ice. Notice how these older players have improved their confidence and skill, increasing their distance and improving their expansion of reach. A double fake, or a double deke as it's called, involves an obvious fake and then another one. Here Joe fakes to the backhand, fakes to the forehand, and then goes around on the backhand. Let's watch Matt do it in slow motion. He's going to fake, transfers his weight, and fakes back wide, and then he goes back around the other side. This is the double deke. He fakes to the backhand, he fakes to the forehand, and then comes back around on the backhand side. Notice the transfer of weight and the expansion of reach. Okay. Here's another look in slow motion. Matt set. He's attacking the player. He puts the puck onto the backhand side, then to the forehand. Notice the use of the inside edges as he comes around and recovers, sets, again moves to the backhand side, fake, fake, reach to the backhand, release, and away he goes. This maneuver is great to develop skills that are required to work in small spaces. Cones also help players to develop moves such as the Mohawk turn. Players open their skates heel to heel and try and control their bodies and the puck as they go one way and then the other around the cone. This maneuver we're watching is the Gretzky move named for the great one's habit of coming down the off wing. All the players you see here are left-handed, and we're setting them up as they come down in a right wing position. They come down and fake to the outside, but then they cut back, separating themselves from the defenseman they would be facing here by going away from the flow. This puts them in a position where they will have some time to operate. Matt does a great job here. He fakes to the outside, cuts back against the flow, and gives himself some room to operate. Now we're going to practice some quick stick drills. The first one is called the reach drill. Matt goes down one side of the cones. He does not weave between them, but stays on one side only. He reaches the puck in between the cones as far as he can and then brings it back out before he passes the next cone. This requires him to improve the quickness of his stick 
because he has to pull that puck quickly before the next cone comes up. The faster he goes, the more challenging the drill becomes. Here's the same drill on the backhand side. The player should release the bottom hand and then quickly bring it back over. Andy moves at a pace he's able to handle, but he's really closer to the cones than he should be. Matt is also too close to the cones as he does this drill. But like Andy, he's handling the puck very well with nice releases and quick hands to bring it back. Doing this drill also develops strength in the forearms and hands. Every time you do it, you expand your comfort zone with the puck at the distance you're becoming more and more accustomed to. You may do this drill three times in the course of a practice, but you might go six months and never do it that many times if you're just playing games. Here's another quick stick exercise called release and recover. It also uses cones, but here the players learn to slide the puck, pull the stick quickly around, and then recover the puck on the other side. In slow motion, you can see that Matt is actually releasing the puck, pulling his stick around the imaginary player, and then recovering that puck on the other side. This develops a great touch. It gives him the confidence to release the puck from the stick and be sure he's going to be able to retrieve it on the other side of the player. The drill makes us move our stick quickly because we're going to have to go around that cone. Here's a demonstration of exactly how these cones substitute for an actual opponent. In this case, when attacking the defending player, he's going to have to slide the puck around or through his legs and then pull his stick around the opponent and pick the puck up on the other side. This demonstration shows why they need to pull the stick away and not over the top of the cone. It would be an impossible move with someone standing there instead of the cone. Now let's look at the backhand version of this exercise. This is more difficult. Weaving the puck between cones develops quickness and confidence. It helps the players to challenge themselves. It's very important that they try to gain speed as they go through the cones, not just glide. It's important for players to understand that when they're playing the game, that their opposition has a triangle on the ice. This is a key factor. Here this triangle is traced out. It represents the player's two skates and his stick that's usually on the ice. Sometimes our job is to attack this triangle by sliding the puck through, then recovering it on the other side. Pylons now represent this diagram of the player's skates and his stick. The attacker comes down, pushes the puck through the triangle anywhere he decides. It might be on the backhand side or it might be on the forehand. As Joe comes down the ice, he slides the puck through the triangle, goes around and then recovers the puck on the other side. This really helps him understand what's going to happen when he actually attacks an opposing player. He develops a feel for releasing the puck and then regaining control of it. Attacking the triangle on the backhand side is a tough, tough skill to master. Substituting live players instead of pylons makes these maneuvers more understandable. These live players just play it like cones. Their purpose is not to stop the attacking player, but just to be there, to let them see the triangle. The player goes through and around. The defender then catches up. So we can do this exercise three or four times using the full length of the ice. Notice that Andy speeds up and lets him do it again. Then, when they come back down the ice, we let the players reverse their roles. I can't think of a better way to build confidence in your hockey skills than to spend 20 minutes of your practice time working on these drills that will help develop your stick handling. All hockey players that I know who have good stick handling abilities are good passers and usually all around fine hockey players. 
Stick handling is an important part of the game. And when we look at hockey players, the ones who stick handle the best are the ones who have the most fun playing the game. Remember, stick handling is an art, and it's an art that needs to be learned and developed, both on and off the ice. By using the training methods outlined in this video, your players will develop better stick handling skills, and as a result, become better hockey players. Good luck, and have fun.